Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Trinity United in Waukegan. It's good to be here together. You'll find everything you need printed in the bulletin. Please rise now for our brief order of confession and forgiveness. We gather today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. The mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, was given to die for us. For his sake, God forgives us all our sins. So called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth.
reading today is from the 8th chapter of Acts, beginning at the 26th verse. Led by the Spirit, Philip encounters an Ethiopian official who is returning to his African home, having been to Jerusalem to worship. Philip uses their encounter to proclaim the gospel to him. Upon coming to faith in Jesus, he is baptized by Philip. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before a shearer, he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For all life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself as Azotius, and as he was passing through the region, he, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our second reading this morning is from the fourth chapter of 1 John, beginning at the seventh verse. We love God and others because God first loved us. We cannot say we love God whom we have not seen, while hating fellow Christians whom we regularly see. Love toward God is to be matched by love toward others because the essence of God is love. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may hold boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are not liar, or are liars. For 
For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please rise as we sing our gospel acclamation. mistakes in their life. 
I don't know where he is today, but my hope is that uh, the hope and presence of God in his life truly did transform him. The point is, through all these people, is you can never tell who God is going to choose to use and in what ways they will be used. Now, in our reading this morning, we have it from the book of Acts. And as you probably know, the book of Acts is about the development of the early church, the development of leaders. But it's not pat dry. It's surprising whom God uses. You remember how Jesus had 12 disciples. Well, you have Judas who betrayed him, so he had to be replaced. It says in chapter 1, by someone who had, quote, accompanied them during the whole time. It was a guy named Matthias. Anybody know anything about Matthias? That's because there's nothing to know. You could read the Bible backwards and forwards. That's the last he was mentioned in the Bible. I'm sure he did great things, but you would think he would have a whole chapter, but that was his, that was his role. We do know that the original disciples, they couldn't handle all the jobs of this new church, so they got some other people to make sure that some of these other things were done, such as taking care of people who were poor and who needed help, people like the widows. The disciples said, well, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables, in other words, to take care of these widows. It goes on to say, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. We will give them our attention to prayer. We will give us our attention to prayer in the ministry of the Word. So they each had their own job. So they picked seven. It included uh, Stephen and Philip, this guy from our Gospel text. They were no slouches. They were picked because they were full of the Spirit and wisdom. But you see, they were chosen really to hang around the church kitchen to do this specific uh, feeding ministry. But God had other plans for them, specifically for Philip. Which brings us to the story of Philip and this Ethiopian eunuch. This was a Philip, there was a disciple named Philip, but this was not him. This was one of the ones who had this uh, lesser job to work with the widows. And it's Philip who we read about at the beginning of chapter 8, out in the sticks in Samaria. He's preaching, he's healing, he's driving out evil spirits. And unlike us, who pray for God's guidance and hope that we're hearing the right message, Philip, we're told, was guided by angels to not return to Jerusalem, as he might have wanted, but to move out farther, to take this desert, or another translation is wilderness road, to truly go into the sticks. Now, the traveler in the chariot is identified as an Ethiopian eunuch. He is a court official of the queen in charge of the treasure. Being a eunuch, a castrated man, made him a safe choice as an official of the court of the queen. Couldn't produce hairs. The women were safe with him. Being a eunuch made him a trusted servant to the queen of Ethiopia. But it also made him a lesser Jew. We know he was a Jew. He had made this long pilgrimage to Jerusalem in order to worship. And he was reading from the scriptures. But he would be seen as a lesser, not a, as a whole person. His life, we can imagine, was one of exclusion. He ever felt excluded, pushed aside for one reason or another. Well, on his way home, he reads from the prophet Isaiah. And he welcomes Philip to help him interpret the scripture he was reading. Philip accepts the eunuch's invitation to climb into the chariot. He sits beside him for some Bible study. And they're looking at this uh, 53rd chapter in Isaiah, the so-called servant song. And the eunuch wonders about the identity. Who is the one that Isaiah speaks about? Well, Philip tells him it's Jesus, and he explains the whole story of Jesus. I like this image of Philip and the eunuch. Their, their heads bent over the text. They're oblivious to the chariot going up and down along this wilderness road. Philip, the eunuch inquiring, Philip proclaiming the good news about Jesus. And we come to this eternal truth that interpreting the scriptures is best as a collaborative 
enterprise. And on the basis of Philip's teaching of Isaiah, the eunuch requests that he be baptized, fulfilling the Great Commission, Jesus' final instructions to his disciples. And the Philip, excuse me, and the eunuch experiences inclusion, the very grace of God personified by Philip. Which leads to us. What do we learn from this text? Well, I notice three themes. How God welcomes, how God values, and how God teaches. First, we notice that God welcomes. The kingdom of God as we know, specifically the church for us, is meant to be open to all. All can be part. All can be included, can be baptized. One of the first converts is also an African from Ethiopia. He is disabled as a eunuch. What is to prevent him from being baptized? What is to prevent anyone from being baptized? Being an infant, being handicapped, having dark skin, speaking an unfamiliar language, nothing keeps one from being joined in Christ or even rejoined. Whether Jew or Greek, to quote Paul, male or female, we all are one in Christ. <coughs> So the question is, how do we actively work to include other people? Not just put up signs saying all are welcome, not just sending out emails, but how do we actively work to include people in this great community? I know for each of you, you see this as a gift, but there's a challenge here too. How do we welcome others? How do we encourage them to come? Well, the second point I think is related to the first, that God doesn't give people the same status or lack of it that we do. God has a different set of values. God sees gems where we might see dirt. God can and will use anyone. Bad speakers, like Moses. Rough fishermen, like Simon Peter. Self-centered, hostile people, like the Apostle Paul. Kitchen help, like Stephen and Philip. <coughs> Kids and senior citizens, immigrants, those that we do not value. Each of us have gifts that God can use, both large and small. The question for us is, how can God open up us up to the different possibilities, even within ourselves? One of the most interesting things as a pastor is to see people try to do things that they've never done before, such as teach a Bible study or hammer a nail as we worked with Habitat for Humanity for a while, or try to get through the barriers that we have with Sagrado Corazon in terms of language. It's easy to say, well, I don't speak their language, and so we can't have anything to do with each other, but try to move beyond those barriers. Of course, with the power of God, all things are possible. Well, finally, I think this story lifts up important teachable moments. You may have heard that phrase before. Unique times and opportunities that come up in life. You ever thought back to your day with regret over a missed opportunity, a kind word that might have been shared, or a chance to be encouraging or uplifting, to lift someone up, maybe even physically, but also emotionally. Maybe a confession of a fault. All of that leads to deeper and more meaningful relationships. The question is, what are the opportunities God has given to us? You may see your life as being sort of used up, maybe towards the end, but God continues to give us opportunities each and every day for the people that we come into contact with. It may be people that we know very well, just taking the extra time to really listen to them and support them. Maybe people that we're just meeting. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for these stories that encourage and inspire and even challenge us. Help us to be open to others. Help us to not devalue others. Help us to be open to those possibilities in each and every moment. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
with you all. Please now rise and share signs of God's peace. seem a little artificial and different for us, doesn't it? But we can wish people peace in various ways throughout the day. Our service continues as we share our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love is triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. We pray for the church around the world, for all ministers, for the mission of the gospel. Keep all the newly baptized and confirmed in your care. Cleanse our hearts with your word and help us to abide in you always. God of grace. For the well-being of the earth and all created things, for rivers and lakes, streams and estuaries, melting glaciers and polluted waters, renew the face of the earth and shower us with your goodness, God of grace. For the nations and all those in authority, for local, state, and national leaders, for elected representatives at every level, for international organizations that justice and peace may reign. God of grace. For all those in need, for any experiencing homelessness or unemployment, for those fleeing from oppression or seeking asylum, for all who are ill or suffering. Especially we want to pray for today, for those on our sick list. Pray for Dorothy and Len, we pray for Bob, for all those battling cancer and recovering from COVID. We also pray for our shut-ins, including Carol and Diana, for Betty and Dave, for Brad and Ross, for Irene, Don and Mary. We also pray for those in service to our country, including Adam Salyer and all members, veterans and members of the military. God of grace, hear our prayer. For this congregation, for the caring ministries of this faithful community, for all who visit and minister to one another, for all who take communion to homes or care centers, for all who seek to share your love with the world, God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray for those who mourn, especially Sharon Morrison and Joe Cole and families on the death of their mother and grandmother, Alma Cole. We pray for Ken Edris and family on the death of his sister, Kathy Lynn. Pray for Dwayne Turnin and family on the death of his mother, Irma. We pray for Bob Johnson on the death of his brother, Bill. Give them comfort, Lord, during this difficult time. With thanksgiving for the saints who rest from their labors, help us like them to bear much fruit and to become your disciples. And at the last, bring us to that heavenly banquet where all will feast together at your table. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love, through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.
after the service, please uh, be here and hang around for that. We appreciate that. There's a big um, one-page uh, article on the Blomquist Seminarian Fund. That was started several years ago. We've utilized it in the past, and uh, we want to continue to utilize it. So we're kind of detailing a plan that $2,000 from that each and every year will support um, new pastors, as you may or may not be aware of, we have a lot of pastors my age or even a, a little older who are now retiring. And we're going to have a big shortage. So we need to find different ways to encourage um, new young pastors coming up. So this is a wonderful thing. If you have it in your heart to contribute to this fund, you can really make a difference in the church. We do have some birthdays coming up. Well, first, an anniversary. I think we highlighted this last week. Ellen and Diane Laburn on the 30th. They are gone this weekend. We also have a couple May birthdays sneaking up this week. Sharon Morrison on the 1st and Kirk Van Gee on the 3rd. Right, Kurt? Yeah, happy birthday. Let's sing happy birthday to our friends. Let's sing happy birthday.